Uh, for more, let's cross to Brussels and uh, correspondent uh, Dave Keating. Uh, that was one of two announcements on vaccines. Yeah, we also got news that the agreement to buy 200 million more doses from Pfizer was officially signed. That's actually not new news. That a deal was reached in early January. But that Moderna news is new, and it's actually quite surprising because Moderna was not supposed to be a big part of the EU's vaccination strategy. Its production capacity in Europe is fairly limited, and so far it really hasn't been used very much. The big emphasis has been on Pfizer. And of course, originally, before Pfizer pulled ahead, it was supposed to be AstraZeneca that was the main vaccine being used in the EU. But of course, we've seen a big conflict between the Commission and AstraZeneca about uh, AstraZeneca not delivering the doses that the Commission says it promised. And also, we've seen several EU member states decide not to give the AstraZeneca vaccine to people over 65 because they think they don't have enough data from the company uh, for people in that age group. Those countries include France and Germany. So it may be that this Moderna purchase is trying to uh, make up for the hesitancy about AstraZeneca in continental Europe. But that being said, just throwing money at uh, the Moderna vaccine isn't going to be able to make the company magically deliver vaccines when it doesn't have uh, the production capacity in Europe. So that was a little confusing, uh, that announcement today. Uh, we also got an announcement that the Commission has come out with a plan to deal with the new variants that are emerging. They are going to be doing more sequencing. Europe has really majorly lagged in sequencing of COVID when compared to Israel and the UK, for instance. Uh, and also, they're going to speed up approval for vaccines vaccines that have already been approved but make adjustments in order to deal with new variants. So in other words, if the Pfizer vaccine uh, altered itself in order to uh, deal with the new variants, it would need new approval, but that could be fast-tracked under these new uh, uh, procedures adopted today. Finally, yesterday we got news that Johnson & Johnson has applied for EU approval. Uh, the EMA is still going to be using the longer, uh, more robust condition market authorization process, but they think they can make that happen a little faster than has happened so far, and they're hoping for approval by mid-March for that Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Now you mentioned uh, how to deal uh, with variants. Let's listen to the Commission president. It's not a vaccine is there and we're over with the whole story, but that will go into a race against that a virus that is raging around the world, and by being um, more and more contagious, uh, the possibility for the virus to mutate is there. So we will always have to be vigilant to be able, if there escape mutations, to fight them with improved vaccines, to produce them, and mainly over time to vaccinate ongoing the vulnerable groups in the population. Yeah, you got to wonder, listening to Ursula von der Leyen, uh, whether or not, Dave Keating, uh, we can just forget for now this concept of reaching herd immunity. Yeah, I mean, that's the big fear here, that as these new variants develop, that the vaccines aren't going to be able to keep pace. Now, so far, it does look like uh, at least the Pfizer vaccine is effective against these new variants. But of course, new variants are going to emerge. It's a normal part of a virus's evolution. So the big point of this plan put forward by the Commission today is to try to give the maximum amount of flexibility when dealing with these new variants and, most importantly, importantly, to identify them early on. I mean, one of the reasons why one of those strains is named the, the British strain is simply because the UK has been very good about sequencing and identifying different strains of the vaccine, and, of the virus rather, and it was identified in the UK, but it probably didn't start in the UK. It probably started somewhere else and the UK just identified it. So this, the, in particular, this push for labs to start sequencing uh, the new types and once someone, basically once someone gets diagnosed with COVID, that that diagnosis comes with a sequencing so they can identify when possible strains happen and, and also look at kind of uh, walling off people who might uh, have that or regions where the new variant is spiraling out of control. And, and we've been talking about the political pressure all week, Dave, uh, here in France, uh, over in Germany, where the interior minister had some uh, choice words for the commissions cr after it criticized the Germans for closing their border. That, that pressure that's growing from citizens to go faster, you feeling it? 
Absolutely. I mean, look, we are, we are approaching one year since we started lockdowns here in Europe. To say people have COVID fatigue would be the understatement of the century. People are getting very, very worked up. And a lot of people are looking to vaccines as the silver bullet that gets us out of this mess. And of course, people here in continental Europe, when they're looking at the UK, the US, Israel, and they see them so much further ahead in the rollout, people are getting very, very frustrated. It should be said that while the EU is behind those three countries, it's actually pretty middle of the pack when you look at developed countries globally. I mean, Canada's rollout has been way worse than any EU country. Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, they haven't even started at all. Uh, so the EU actually isn't doing that bad for the rollout. But there is a context in that the US and the UK used a different procedure for authorization in which they were able to start earlier. And also, particularly in the UK, they have hit that uh, quarter of the population figure, but that's because they're using a, a delayed second dose strategy. They are giving out all doses immediately once they receive them, and they're delaying the second dose for three months. Here in the EU, countries are saving a second dose to give to people in four weeks. Uh, so that is the context there. I think when we're looking at such different strategies for the vaccination campaigns, it's going to be get it's going to get harder and harder to compare different countries when they're using different strategies. Because if you compare EU countries to the UK looking at first dose, it's it's misleading because you're not looking at the EU strategy of saving a dose for later. And if you compare full vaccination, that is two doses, then it's also misleading because you're not taking into account the UK's strategy uh, based on science that says one dose does provide provide you quite a bit of inoculation from the, the uh, virus. Uh, so really, as we're going ahead here, I think people are going to be very antsy to be making comparisons, to be demanding that things go faster. But this is a very, very tricky endeavor. And really, success or failure in the coming months is going to depend a lot on national factors on the ground. We've seen a huge variance uh, in different EU member states and their performance here. I mean, Denmark thinks it can have all of its adult population vaccinated by the end of June. Meanwhile, France, that is certainly not the case. So we're seeing huge variance uh, across the EU, which is really mostly down to national factors, not decisions here in Brussels. And as we look forward to the next months, it's those national decisions that are probably going to make the biggest difference. All right. Many thanks. Dave Keating reporting live there. Uh, from uh, Brussels.